What's interesting now is that I can create a private CDN, a private content distribution network, over the public internet and allow you to view my content and I can control what you're going to see through digital rights management or any other technique I choose to use. That's new. So I think you're going to see a split come very, very soon. Stuff that's good for computers, stuff that's good for the living room. Both may be using the public internet for distribution, but one might live in a website environment where there's other real estate to sell, where you have either blog or contextual information, metadata that's not so much metadata as it is true data and contextual information around it, stories, ways you can acquire things that are web-like, and then you've got a pure visual experience on a television that happens to be connected to the internet as opposed to or maybe in conjunction with a cable system or an over-the-air tuner. And I see these things coexisting and actually each is going to have their own kind of creative that's best suited for it. People always talk about the technology first and it's always a mistake. The thing that drives technology is creative. Something interesting. If there's any compelling reason for anyone to be watching me right now on the internet, then they will. If I'm doing something that's so creatively interesting or so important or the information I have is valuable in any way, then people will watch. Maybe not a lot of people. And so that's the beauty of this very democratized distribution methodology and this very democratized production methodology. But you know what's not democratized about this speech? What's not democratized about this particular speech is promotion. The only people who know this is on the internet right now are you and me and anybody who might come to beat TV. And that's where the big media companies have an edge that no technologist can even emotionalize. They'll intellectualize it, but they won't emotionalize emotionalize it. A full 25% of the commercials you see on television are for television. TV is the largest advertiser on TV themselves. And they, they don't spend 25% of their airtime advertising their shows and getting you to watch. They won't have the ratings they need. We don't have a mechanism inside the public internet to do that. We have no way to promote. We have got to have a media partner. Either it's a print partner or a broadcast partner or a radio partner. It's other media that help drive the internet. Now you could talk about search, discovery, RSS, any kind of internet publicity or any kind of internet promotion you want, but it doesn't in any way ever equal what can be done just tonight on the local news, let alone a national television show. So if you want to understand the real numbers involved, 30 million people picking up the phone to call in to vote for American Idol, if you're doubting the power of television, try some of that. Get 30 million people to call. I'm asking you, call in right now. I don't think 30 million people are going to call in. Internet video is very misunderstood and for a couple of reasons. One, people seem to still want to make a delineation between real programming and user-generated content. Now, I don't know what real programming is. I do think I know what user-generated content is, but the distinction is usually made between, okay, that's an episode of ER, that's Lord of the Rings, that's, that's um, Harry Potter. Harry Potter is a movie. It's real content. Hollywood wants to protect it. Oh, this is a jackass on a skateboard in his driveway doing something silly. No one cares what happens to that. As long as you're making those kinds of distinctions between the content, and by the way, the computer doesn't and the distribution methodologies don't because they're ones and zeros. So as long as you're making a distinction between what they are, then you have rights holders and stakeholders who want to make distinctions between what they are. Someone who owns the rights to Harry Potter and wants to rent you an opportunity to view it with your eyes will charge you in a pay-per-view environment at a local movie theater for openers. And when they can no longer charge you somewhere between five and fifteen dollars to walk into the movie theater, they'll make it available through other ways. They'll put it on the DVD, they'll make it available on television, they'll make it available on premium cable. There's a whole set of windows that are well understood in this business, how things get distributed, and how they charge each time you watch for each kind of way you watch. And this has been going on for a long time. They're defendable walled gardens. They're form factors that, that the industry has used, and they're very defensible. If you buy a, uh, a song on a CD and you rip it to your to your uh, computer. You don't necessarily have the ability to make that a ringtone, so they've charged you $14.99 for the CD, they charge you $0.99 cents for the ringtone, $2.49 for the ringback tone, a buck forty-nine for the wallpaper of the artist for your cell phone. All of these you could get in one place, but they've done a very good job, the media companies, of separating out how you will pay for those things for each individual form factor. So there's a consumer misconception that when you buy something you own it, as opposed to you're renting it or you're renting the, the rights to view it. That all has to get worked out because the, the technology doesn't differentiate between people who want to restrict those things and people who want to who want free access. So there's, that's one whole side of your question comes to you know, wh where, where do we get 
what is the content and, and what's the value of the content because there's a media consumption scale based on the value of the content.